and welcome to the fifth of our 2021 virtual event series. My name is Kelly Moran, and we are just wrapping up our very first cruise of this expedition season. And for the entire exploration season, these events will be opportunities to hear about the excitement of all of the expeditions, preview the stories coming to you from sea, meet and engage with inspiring team members of the OET's core of exploration, and learn about the science, technology, and engineering that excite them. We're so happy and glad to have you joining us on Facebook and also YouTube. Uh, you can ask us questions and send in your comments throughout this whole entire program. So feel free to send us questions if you have any as they pop up when you're uh, listening to this presentation in the comment section. But right now we'd love to know a bit more about where everyone's joining us from. So please send us uh, where you're located and where you're watching from. We'd love to know a bit more about uh, where everyone is located for this presentation. As the current expedition is finishing up today, uh, our next expedition to Cascadia Margin begins on Thursday, so just a few days away. Tomorrow, the ship will arrive in Astoria, Oregon to demo uh, from this mapping transit up there, and then we will be uh, getting ready for the next expedition in just a few days. It takes a few days to get everyone off, get the new team on, uh, and get all the science equipment on for this next expedition. Joining us today are two scientists who are leading that upcoming expedition, Tamara Bomberger and Susan Murley. So first I wanna introduce everyone to them. Hi, Susan, hi, Tamara. Hi. Hello, thank you very much for having us. Oh, absolutely. So uh, Tamara, let's start with you. Um, can you introduce us to the Cascadia region uh, where the ship will be heading and kind of what's going on there to make Nautilus and our team want to go there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, we first start in uh, in the port of Astoria, heading out um, toward to the Cascadia Margin. The Cascadia Margin is an area uh, that is located basically between the Mendocino Fracture Zone and uh, up. Uh, well, the U.S. part is uh, up to the Van de Fuca Strait, and we will be working basically off the coast of Oregon and off off the coast coast of Washington. So this is a uh, um, the Cascadia subduction zone, part of it. And at this subduction zone, we have lots and lots of uh, methane seep going on. So you, you have an illustration here where you actually see what is happening at this subduction zone. So one plate is uh, getting subducted subducted under another one. And there where these two plates uh, meet, a lot of sediments gets like swept up off from the plate that is going underneath the second one. And we just have huge piles of sediment, seamounts, and also some sediment coming in from the land that is uh, transported by rivers. And then there's a lot of organic carbon that is in there. This organic material, organic carbon can decay to, to methane and also gets uh, uh, used by microbes to generate meth methane. And then all this methane that uh, can escape from the sediments and that's bubbling up the seafloor. And these are the areas we're actually gonna, gonna visit, like uh, the methane seeps and the whole ecosystems they are driving uh, from these methane seeps. Yeah, here, this is an Im image from uh, our cruise on the Nautilus in 2018. So that is uh, close to the Astoria Canyon. And you see how these bubble streams are actually bubbling out of the seafloor. And also we see some methane hydrate, which can be stable as well in areas that have a certain pressure and temperature condition that, that are fav favorable for this uh, solid type. It's an ice type of hydrate, uh, of methane hydrate, basically. Awesome, thanks. And can you talk a bit more about these seeps? Are they always in bubble form and are they always the same types of chemicals or uh, nutrients that are coming up out of the seafloor or is this specific to just this location? Mm -hmm. um, they can actually vary in, in the, the chemistry. So here, the, the seeps we have been visiting so far and most likely also the ones we're going to look at, they have mostly methane, but there are other areas like further South California also uh, in the ca Canadian um, uh, Cascadia margin where you actually found more higher hydrocarbons where I mean like like ethane as well or just more sea change uh, chain, chains or seas are changed together and you have uh, other type of carbon constituents but with us it's mostly methane that are driving the system and then 
of course, you have like more chemical reactions going on with like the microbes oxidizing this methane and uh, they are using sul sulfate from the seawater and also the seawater that's in, in training the sediments and then they produce sulfide and then from this sulfide like lots of um, uh, the seep fauna can live off so that that's how how this whole um, uh, seeps are actually living from just the, the methane flow coming from underneath. Wow, that's that's super cool. And this footage from a previous expedition just shows the diversity and the the life around there. Um, so we'll be going kind of a pretty large stretch off the western coast of the U.S. from southern Oregon to northern Washington to various different sites. Uh, almost kind of what are you most excited about for you know these different locations, and what can our viewers expect to see, or what are you hoping to see at each of these different locations? Yeah, we have we have about eleven different locations we are going to visit. So the idea is um, to start to sail south to southern Oregon and start there and kind of make our way up north. We will have to vary a little bit depending on the weather and see where where the the, the ocean and the winds are favorable favorable for our dives. And um, we so we try to cover not only like the different latitudes but also different uh, locations on the the sites like uh, on the on the slope like some close to the shelf where it's very shallow then going down the slope where, where we get into deeper waters but also something uh, close to the base of the slope uh, from the subduction zone so we, we hope to see a variation of uh, ecosystems like the ones that had a little are also older had a bit more time to get more involved may, probably see more any animal just bigger seep sites but then also the shallower one where it's probably just sediments and few bubbles and bacteria and mats coming out uh, from the different areas. Well, I'm looking forward to all the dives and hoping to see different things at each one. Um, I want to pull in Susan now to talk a bit about how we find all of these seeps. Uh, Susan, can you what, talk a bit about the subduction that's happening? We're going to be seafloor mapping along a specific area, um, but how do we know if we're finding seeps or how do we know if we're mapping over the right location? Well, what we just what we need to do is just to map. I mean, there's so much of, of the ocean seafloor that hasn't been mapped. And and the more that we map, the more that we find. Um, um, basically, the very, very little of Cascadia margin was mapped with this newer um, type of uh, bathymetry and co-registered water column data. So it's uh, a new, yeah, this is a new type of uh, technology that's only been around for about 10 years. So before we had this, it was really difficult to see where the seeps were. Now you can, looking at this image, you can see the seafloor and then you see that cone, I mean, that triangle is basically what the ship can image. So now they can't, it, these new systems can image the water column as well as the seafloor simultaneously. So we've only mapped about 50% of Cascadia margin and most of that is deeper because it's easier to map because your coverage is based on depth. It's about four or five times water depth. So when you get into really shallow water, it takes forever. Um, and 40% of the margin is less than 200 meters and very little of that has been mapped at all. So. I, we know we'll find seeps there as well. It's just that, you know, we need the funding. We need, you know, um, it's it, it's gonna take a long time. This is an image of, yeah, of, <laughs> of what, what we do find. And this is how I kind of visualize a lot of it is, this is like a knoll, uh, a carbonate ridge off of Southern Oregon. And the, the um, vertical bands you see, those are actually the plumes, the methane, bubble streams um, seeping off the top of that little knoll, carbonate knoll. So we've found, a, you know, basically almost everywhere we've looked, we've found methane seeps. So on this margin, you know, we've used the same technology to map volcanoes and all sorts of other things that our group does as well. But it's just been wonderful addition to have this water column data that's co-registered with the seafloor data. It's crazy how in depth you can see the plumes coming up off of the seafloor in 
you know, super deep water, you it's hard to imagine just on the bottom of the ship, this multi-beam system, finding all of these uh, coming up off the seafloor. Do you know how many seeps we've rough, not just Nautilus, but maybe anyone searching in this area, how many seeps have been detected so far? The data that I've looked at and has been combined with Riedel, who did a lot of work off Canada and some work with fisheries vessels, we found about 3,500 bubble streams. But, and, wow. and that's what the little flags are. You see the little black things on the, those are bubble streams that we've detected. And the very brightly colored stuff is the multi-beam, new multi-beam data that we've collected. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in the number, there have been other cruises that have went out there since us and they've discovered hundreds more. So, and I'm not sure if they're just repeats of what we found or brand new bubble streams. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot going on out there. It's really pretty amazing. It seems like almost everywhere we looked, we would find these bubble streams. Yeah, that's a pretty large number. And knowing that not all of it has actually been mapped, you know, in its complete form yet, uh, do you expect there's a lot more still down there yet to be found? Oh yeah, I would say triple, quadruple the number that we've found so far. We haven't really looked a lot, like I said, in shallow water. So, yeah. but if when you're looking at this map, all of the blue and red dots are individual bubble streams that, that have been found in two different data sets. And you'll notice there's that black line there. That's the 500 meter isobar, which is um, contour, which is basically uh, where you might find hydrate destabilize, destabilization. You won't find hydrates any shallower than 500 meters. So we mapped along that line because we're concerned about climate change and we wanted to know what's out there now and if those hydrates start to melt, what we're gonna see in the future. So we sort of focused on that on that black line. But a lot of people have, you know, we've mapped other things too and you notice it's mostly deeper, which is a lot easier to map. Doesn't take as much time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm really curious kind of what made you want to study uh, these seeps and where they all are in this location um, with the mapping technology? Did you always want to, uh, you know, use multi-beam data to find methane seeps or is this a new uh, involvement for you in knowing where they all are, especially off the Cascadia margin? Why don't you go with that one, Tamara? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our group is typically We've studied underwater volcanoes. That's that's sort of, I've been with this group for almost 25 years and that's kind of what we've done. We've mapped in active volcanic areas and it was just sort of a um, an easy step, you know, to, to do this. And we're interested because we live in Oregon, we live on the coast and we really want to know what's going on in our environment right offshore. So it just seemed like a logical step. And yeah with the seabed 2030 project and and the interest in mapping the US EEZ it was also a good good direction for our group to head absolutely uh we do have a question coming in and either one of you are feel free to take it um someone is asking do volcanic eruptions uh, under the ocean affect nearby plants and animals so i know you've studied them especially with the mapping system but does your group and do you have any uh, data on do these volcanic eruptions, do they affect the uh, seabed and the organisms that are near them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this type of volcanic eruption, you also have like lots of chemical coming out during these eruptions. These chemicals, they can again, they provide some energy for, for bacteria to live on. And it's kind of like this bacteria then support the food chain up. So yeah, there's some some food coming out from from these eruptions and we have, we often see when we work on the volcanoes that there's a very di diverse um fauna around them and, and also animals and unless that volcano is really actively erupting which we've seen at one point and then it just becomes almost toxic for animals like like mm -hmm. we saw at west mata it, the diversity is not there because it's just too toxic an area for animals to live We've seen like shrimp falling out of the water column and wow. when there's active 
volcanism going on. Right, really, yes, yeah, with lava streams and like. Right, yeah. right. But then as soon as it starts cooling down, you have the life coming in. Right, right. It's cool mm -hmm. to think that they, you know, after this destruction down there, that organisms can come back after it's a bit calmer for them and they have a sense that, you know, there's not this many chemicals coming up out of the seafloor that they know mm -hmm. to come back and rebuild those communities. So uh, thank you for answering that. And for everyone in the audience too, if you have more questions, again, feel free to type them in the comment section on Facebook and YouTube. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but Tamara, I'd love to talk a bit about what kind of samples are you going to be taking for this expedition? I know we're gonna be multi-beam mapping to look for more seeps and uh, you know go maybe over the ones that we've found previously, but can you talk a bit about some of the other technology that we'll be using? Are you going to be taking samples and uh, how do you even collect bubble sure. samples out of the seafloor? <laughs> Not yes. <easy>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we are, we are a very diverse team of scientists that is going out to the geo, geophysicists, geochemists, geologists, and uh, biologists mo uh, mostly. So we have like quite a diverse uh, type of samples we are doing. So I'm, I'm a geochemist, so I'm very interested of the bubbles that are coming out at the seafloor. And I'm using specially designed gas tight uh, bottles that are connected to, to a funnel. So basically, we yeah, dive exactly here. You see an image from a previous cruise, how we have a funnel connected to our gas tight bottles. So we just hold the funnel over this bubble stream, wait until we have plenty of gas in the funnel, and then we can trigger uh, these bottles from, from the ship. They are connected with the hydraulic system and uh, these bottles are evacuated so we have a high vacuum line uh, on on ship on board so we can evacuate them first and then at the seafloor as soon as we trigger the bottle this gas gets like in, goes into the bottle and is uh, we can close it off and there it stays safe the gas uh, it's a uh, gas tight so even when we come with very high very high pressures at the seafloor then come up uh, to the boat with the pressure change and everything. So we are not going to lose any of our sample during this whole process. So that, that is how we uh, collect all our gas at the seafloor. And and um, yeah, here you see um, after we sample, so that now the sample is taken. So we had some gas left in the funnel and now we just uh, basically emptied up. But you saw there was some hydrate building along the funnel so that, that uh, tells me that uh, during that dive, we were actually in an area where it was uh, deeper than the 500 uh, meter contra that Susan just pointed out, like we were within the st stability field of um, hydrate. Wow, that's then, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I do have a question from the audience that goes along with this, and yeah. they're wondering, how long does it take for the methane or other compounds that are coming up in these seeps, how long does it take for them to dissolve in the water? Do they dissolve in the water or do they make it all the way to the surface? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's actually the process is starting basically right away when you when they enter. So it's it's methane, it's a reduced um, uh, particle and it comes in a, in a bubble basically. But as soon as it enters the, the seawater, so you have lo lots of oxygen, lots of nitrogen like in the seawater. So the exchange of uh, methane dissolving out and uh, all the gases getting into the bubble, that happens actually quite quick, quickly. So they usually arise at the 20 to 30 centimeter per second, like the, the bubble rises through the water column. And uh, they most of them don't make it to the surface water. Like after, depending on the size of the bubble, it can be after 30 meters, after 100 meters that it's already dissolving out. Some uh, plumes we uh, deserve, uh, not deserve, observe uh, high rides uh, several hundred meters. But that often is then connected uh, to having a hydrate skin around the bubble when it leaves the seafloor, where, so it's protected and can rise a little further up. But it's mostly only the very shallow seeps that um, where the bubbles actually have a chance to to reach uh, surface waters. And and in that last video you were showing, you can you notice that you really didn't see any bubbles until they poked that instrument into the seafloor. So there's a lot. the staying you know yeah so. it's oversaturated see uh, just underneath yeah yeah awesome thank you and uh another question from the audience i know um tamara you mentioned there's a whole bunch of different scientists who are on board this expedition uh studying the same thing but all in different kind of aspects of it um is there specific objectives for this cruise in this expedition 
Uh, is it to C4 map? Is it to collect the methane bubbles for you? Uh, are there other scientists who are also wanting samples of other things? Is there a few objectives that you're really hoping to accomplish uh, over the next few weeks? Yeah, absolutely. We have actually a whole set of uh, um, objectives. One of it is sure, Susan pointed that already out, to map some of the still unexplored areas so that we can add a, a bit more coverage to, to the seafloor and the water column mapping there. But um, this is map ha mostly happening while we are transiting and during nighttime. And uh, during the daytime, we will be diving with the ROE. And uh, then we want to explore like the whole ecosystem not on the bubbles is is my part of the the cruise but the we will also take biological samples we will take some push curl samples like getting uh, information about the sediment but also getting information about the poor water that's that is sitting in these sediments that would then be the di dissolved component then we will be sample like clams bacterial mats to tube worms and then we do some biological studies on these so that we get some information about the, the food web and also uh, what the biogeochemistry is of the whole system and we will also be looking at the water column itself so now i was more like talking about yeah the, the source of the methane that will be the, uh, um uh, found out and then the, the biogeochemistry and the biology and but then we also look at the fate of of all these chemicals what happens in the water column so we have some uh, niskin uh, bottle samples that we will collect actual water from the water column the overlying water column from these seeps and also do uh, chemical and biological studies on these to get some information there as well and and noticing too looking at all the animals down there i mean there's are very similar to what we see at hydrothermal um, vents. Um, they, they're all chemosynthetic. So, you know, they're not living from photosynthesis and that's something to, all of these, you know, chemicals that are coming out of the seafloor are actually fueling those animals. So just to keep that in mind. Awesome, thank you. And uh, you touched on it briefly. Do you mind explaining, Susan, what chemosynthetic organisms are if for people who don't know that organisms can not use sunlight well and people didn't know that for a long long time i think with with the discovery of hydrothermal vents back 30 years ago or so um in the Galapagos, i mean people believed that only animals could only live with sunlight and so basically this is that's photosynthesis right so chemosynthesis is that the source of life for these animals is, are actually the chemicals that are coming out of the seafloor. So, yeah. Yeah. Really, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Tamara. No, no, I just want to add the chemical reaction to this, which is probably <laughs> not what we need. Yes, so yeah. it's, it's basically the methane uh, rising up or getting released in the sediments, reacting with the seawater sulfate. So that together then generates a uh, bicarbonate and sulfide. Then the sulfate is sulfide that gets generated is basically fueling all this ecosystem. And the bicarbonate that, that can then go to together with what with um water and calcium and uh, actually precipitate as uh, carbonate. So we actually also form rocks by these um, reaction in this uh, ecosystem. So we have like from this uh, chemosynthesis, we, we, we drive life, but also uh, form some habitat or some hard ground where life can uh, live on as well. So yeah, just wanted to add that with a little bit of chemistry background or biogeochemistry background. You're the, you're the chemist, yes. <laughs> No, all good points. Um, and we do have a lot of uh, good questions coming in about these uh, seeps and the bubbles coming up. Uh, one question that I'd love to ask is, could these bubbles bring up rare microbes from deep within the earth? Uh, is it only, how deep do they go really? And what kind, you know, you mentioned methane and uh, some other compounds, but can they bring up rare microbes as well some from super deep? Um, probably not from super deep because the, the micros they don't like it super hot and super high pressure, so they stick around like uh, the shallower subsurface, and they are actually also the ones uh, like work, working these gases. So I mean, I, I would think more like in the water column, you you do have like the bubble stream that can transport other components up in the water. So we, we do have a transport of uh, uh, also different chemicals and uh, possibly. The, the chemicals kind of provide food, so maybe the microbes stick along, and yeah, so 
this is probably mostly what happens in the water column, but mm -hmm. not so much like from very deep that we would not uh, expect. Great, thank you. And um, Susan, you had mentioned that we found rough, well, not so much novels, but everyone has found about 3,500 seeps so far in this location. Uh, someone is asking, are these seeps constant or do they increase and decrease? And do they go away completely if we map over at the same area and now what we thought were seeps are now gone? Uh, does that ever happen? <laughs> yes, that, that has happened. Um, we, we went to a deep site at about 1,200 meters off of Hecata Bank um, a few years ago, we placed a marker, a seafloor marker there so that we knew where we had sampled. And then we went back the next year and they had totally shut off there. But um, 50 meters away, there was all these beautiful bubble streams and this beautiful community of animals. So yeah, they can shut off and, you know, turn on and off. So we haven't, repeated dives enough to really, you know, be able to give you any kind of number on that. But yeah, they, they can shut off. And also the tides affect them, yep. you know. So when the tidal cycle is high, there's more water uh, above these seeps. So it dampens them down. And that's been pretty much proven in other literature. Yeah, thank you. And, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, that also makes our diving tricky sometimes because what we typically do when we arrive at the site, when we, we go and want to dive, so we, we would run the ship over these bubble shrimps to, to map them out, to know uh, exactly where the position is, then deploy the ROE. And once we dive there, and it's maybe two, three, four hours later, could be that these bubble shrimps are not active anymore. So there, there are surprises. <laughs> and also like just the, the pressure change sometimes when the ROV sits on the seafloor. So it yeah. basically can just turn off the a bubble stream that we observed for minutes before we tried to sample. So it's a very dynamic system. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Are you expecting to do um, a lot of diving over the next week and a half or so? Yeah, we will be diving every day, uh, weather permitted, of course, but yes. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah, that, that's the main objective. I mean, if you're out there with a remote lab operated vehicle, you have to use it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, true. And <laughs> I, it's not as strictly a mapping cruise at all. I mean, the main objective is to dive with the ROV, get down on the bottom. Great. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to pull another question from the audience and they're asking, uh, about more seep organism so we'll stick with things that live near the seeps um but do you find a diversity in what organisms are not only consuming what's coming up out of the sea floor around these seeps are they different between the shallower ones and the deeper ones does the fauna in flora even does it change depending on how deep uh you're exploring yeah, this is actually some scientific questions from our biologists that they are working on and um one paper has been published three years ago now, I think, and they, they were observing some differences, but it's also still, we haven't had enough dives yet at the different locations and different depths so that we really could work with some uh, statistics and, and really get proper information what like they all have in common and what they have, uh, what the differences are. So that's still a work in pro progress and is one of our scientific questions, yes. Awesome. Thank you. And um, another question is asking, we're getting a lot of really good seep questions, so I'm really happy about it. Um, are they traditionally found at these tectonic plates or is it just the Pacific Ocean? Is it any tectonic plates around, you know, the whole entire ocean? Um, are they similar all over the world or is it kind of just, are these happening just right here where we're going? Yeah. Um, yeah, Susan, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've been discovered. Um, uh, they found a lot of methane seeps off of the East Coast. You know, these they're on, in this case, it's an accretionary margin. You know, you if you go out on the Pacific plate, you're not going to find methane seeps. So they're not everywhere. You have to have the right tectonic um, mar um, regime. We're hoping to get up into Alaskan waters and do some more looking for them on a similar type of um, area where you have a subduction zone. Um, and But they have been found in places where it's, there's not a subduction zone as well. Mm -hmm. You're sure. And tomorrow you've, you've seen these in Norway and 
yeah, in the, the North Sea, the Black Sea, the East Coast, Gulf of California, um, Gulf of Mexico. And I mean, it's it's basically yeah, all the areas what Susan mentioned already, where we have a, a margin, like it's uh, active or also passive margin. It doesn't necessarily be right. like that it's still moving, but it's kind of, we, we need a lot of organic material. That means we need some sediment that is like stuffed with like, organics coming from land or or from uh, subduction that is piling up the, the sediments and so that we have kind of the fuel to drive these systems so yeah but they're very common like yeah around oh, the world yeah. on many of the margins yeah yeah world worldwide great thank you um okay so i want to talk a bit about the cascadia margin in general and why we're going there uh We've talked about this, obviously, seeps, we're mapping, but why is it so important to map where the seeps are or to study the seeps and what's in the bubbles uh, for you two, especially? Why, what we're doing with you on board as our lead scientists, what, you know, what makes this area so important and why are we going back again? We've been, you know, a couple of years now. So what makes this area for you two uh, important to study and um, kind of do your work while on board? Yeah, it's 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 still ex exploration. So we we have so many like seeps we haven't been looking at. I mean, we we know they're like way too many to to, to look at because uh, we find them like all over the place. But it's basically like um, studying and exploring areas and characterize these seep systems that we don't know much about yet. And it's about estimating the number of these seeps so that so that we get an idea of how much car how much carbon gets actually released at a margin of that and how it integrates in the whole carbon cycle. But um, is, if it has uh, an impact on on the the chemistry, the local chemistry of the ocean, or even if they can reach the atmosphere, some impact on climate change, like how is the evolution of this methane flux to the um, and uh, evaluation if uh, we have some uh, impact on the global carbon budget from these seeps, and also like generating a baseline to know how is it looking right now, because especially in our case at the Cascadia margin, is it's an active margin that means we have subduction some ducting going on we have small earthquakes here we have landslides so we want to know how is it looking right now so that we can compare um to to the baseline from now uh, to see if we have a future change especially with the hydrate stability zone if we have moved there and kind of adding so the hydrate is a huge reservoir for carbon like that is just sitting underneath in the seafloor so we want to know to do we actually add more and more and more carbon to our oceans? And well, and, and, yeah. and also, I mean, it's part of the seabed 2030. I mean, we need to know what's going on in our US EEC. And there's still, you know, over 40%, 50% that hasn't been looked at yet, that hasn't been mapped with this new technology. Um, so, I mean, it's important. It's right offshore here. I mean, there's, so it's also just, our need to map our EEZ and find out what's there. I mean, who knows what else we're going to find. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, I want to pull in one more question from our audience before we have to wrap up. But um, I'm also really curious about this, too. Someone is asking, I know you study ocean seeps, uh, but do you think or are there, if you know of, um, are there fossil seeps or extinct seeps that are on land that was once underwater? Do you, are we able to find them? And if so, do they? How would we know <laughs> if we're seeing a seep where one would have been? It's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Yeah, I actually. <laughs> um, I, I, one, thing, one thing I would have to say is, I mean, you can look at the permafrost. It's very similar situation that's going on on land mm -hmm. so um and we're seeing permafrost melting all over the globe right now with the climate crisis so um we can look at that on land i don't know of anything that's been underwater that they've yeah, yeah. i don't know either yeah but <laughs> <That's enough. laughs> there are similar yeah there's similar ecosystems on land yeah awesome thank you okay i have one last question for you um more of a fun one but uh i'm wondering what are you most looking forward to for being uh back on ev nautilus and it doesn't have to be about seeps or mapping or anything um just what are you most excited about for the next two weeks while on the ship 
food, somebody making me food three times a day and taking good care of us. And I miss people. It's going to be nice to see all the people again. Yeah. That's a big one for me too. Like we, we already have been working with several of the people or of the Nautilus team. So I'm looking looking forward to to meet everyone that I already know and and everybody uh, who is new. Uh, no, not new to me to the team <laughs> on the cruise. Like and yeah, interaction with people, especially now with spending a year almost uh, <laughs> with exactly. knowledge. Yeah, yeah, interaction with people. Yeah. <laughs> to see somebody, <laughs> someone again. Completely agree. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today and joining everyone watching. Happy packing. I know you guys head to the ship tomorrow. Uh, so we're so excited for the upcoming expedition in just a couple of days. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and for everyone watching, this series will continue throughout the entire expedition season. So we'll be hosting these all the way up through December to bring you exciting adventures from the East and Central Pacific. And you can share this channel, your Facebook, YouTube uh, with all of your friends and family. But you can also watch previous live events at nautiluslive.org. All of our expeditions, the mapping, the diving, you can watch the exploring of these seeps live at nautiluslive.org as well. We stream 24 seven during the expedition season. So we hope to see you there. You can send in your questions on our website as well for Susan and Tamara to answer when they're on watch up in the control van on board. Uh, join us this Thursday for the start of their expedition at the Cascadia margin. Uh, and you can watch it all live, send in your questions and comments. And uh, we loved having you today. Our next live event will be in the next uh, first few weeks of August, which we'll talk about our upcoming expedition after the Cascadia margin, which is with the Ocean Network's Canada team off the coast of British Columbia. So exciting couple of weeks coming up. Uh, tomorrow and Susan, safe travels to the ship. And we're excited to be talking to, with you all on board Nautilus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly and the team. This was really nice. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.